Welcome to part four or five on chapter three, the chemical basis of life two. So far we've looked at carbohydrates and lipids. This section is gonna be about proteins. Proteins have the most diverse functions of the four different groups of molecules we're looking at. These functions include gene expression, and we'll talk about gene expression, so how DNA is used to create proteins, and then those proteins give us all of our traits and characteristics. And um, we'll get to that in chapter 11 and 12. Proteins are also used in motion, so we have lots of proteins in our muscles. They're used for defense mechanisms and organisms. Proteins are also really, really important in metabolism, specifically a type of protein called an enzyme. And enzymes help speed up chemical reactions in cells. And we'll get to enzymes later, so you'll learn all about enzymes. Other proteins are used for signaling, so signaling between cells, for example. Proteins are used for support. Um, there's a picture of a spider web on the slide. Spider, or the web part, is made up of really long proteins that are strung together and they're sticky. Other proteins can be used for transport. So we have a picture of red blood cells at the bottom on the slide. There's a protein called hemoglobin that transports oxygen to all the cells in our body. The monomer, or those building blocks of proteins, are called amino acids. And this is showing the structure of kind of a generic amino acid. So you have a carbon atom in the middle of your amino acid. There's a carboxyl group to the right. So a carboxyl group is one of those functional groups. To the left, we have another functional group called an amine. It has a nitrogen and three hydrogens to it. At the bottom, you have a hydrogen, and then at the top, you see there's a little R. And that R part, that's going to be different because there's 20 different amino acids. This slide is showing those 20 different amino acids, and you can kind of see, um, if you look at the top, there's one called glycine up here. So glycine, it has that carbon in the middle the amine group to the left, carboxyl group to the right, and a hydrogen at the bottom. And then the top part, the blue box, is showing that R group. So glycine just have, has a hydrogen for that R group spot. Alanine, the amino acid right next to glycine, has a CH3 for its R group. So you can see that each of these 20 amino acids have a different R group. And again, that's in the blue box for that amino acid. And these different R groups, they give the amino acids different properties. So for example, the top box includes amino acids that are nonpolar. So those amino acids, since they're nonpolar, they're actually, actually hydrophobic. So if you remember that from earlier in this chapter and also from chapter 2. The middle group of amino acids, it says they're polar molecules right here. So these amino acids are hydrophilic, so they're water-loving amino acids. And then the final group at the bottom, so those five amino acids at the bottom including um, asparagic asparagic acid, glutamic acid, these are polar molecules that have a charge. So some of these have a negative charge to them or they're acidic. The other three amino acids have a positive charge or they're basic. Right here. So these are the 20 different amino acids. So we're going to use these to build up our proteins. So those amino acids, they're going to be joined together using that dehydration or condensa condensation reaction we talked about. 
And when the amino acids bond together during this reaction, you get what's called a peptide bond between your two amino acids. And once you have a lot of amino acids joined together, that forms a structure called a polypeptide. And proteins can be made up of one of these polypeptides or several of these polypeptides that kind of work together. So proteins, they can be smaller, just one polypeptide, or they can be really large proteins. And then to break your proteins apart, you just do that hydrolysis reaction. So you add water, the amino acids break apart, and you get back to those monomers. So here's an example of two amino acids. We have glycine and alanine, and they're going to go through that condensation or dehydration reaction. And then after that reaction's over, on the right side we have our peptide bond that forms between the two amino acids. And your amino acids, they just keep on joining together using that dehydration or condensation reaction. So you get lots of peptide bonds, lots of those amino acids bonded together, and then eventually you end up with a polypeptide down at the end. And that's just your linear chain of amino acids. And they can be anywhere from um, 100 to maybe like 300 amino acids. So these proteins that we've been building up, you're putting your amino acids together, you have different levels of structure. So basically the protein is going to fold up into these really cool 3D structures. And the structures, they're primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And I'll go through and show you these different levels. This is an example of a primary structure. And basically primary structure, it's just how the amino acids are laid out in a line. So you have your amino acid sequence. And this sequence is determined by the genes that we have in our DNA. So this is part of the gene expression, one function of proteins. And again, we'll get into that more later on. Um, but just for right now, this primary structure or amino sequence is determined by the genes. These amino acids, once they're strung together, then you start to have chemical and physical interactions. So you remember some amino acids are polar, some are nonpolar, some have a positive charge, some have a negative charge. So they're going to start to interact, and this is going to cause folding. So in secondary structure, you can get alpha helices and another type of folding called a beta pleated sheet. And these are really important. They help determine the protein's characteristics and what it's going to look like. In addition to those two types of folding, there's also another type called random coiled regions. And they're a little bit different than the alpha helices or the beta pleated sheets, but they're also really important to the function of the protein. This slide is showing some of those alpha um, helices, and they are the helix or spring-like structures, there's one on the um, bottom left, and then there's also another helix in the middle. You can see it kind of looks like a spring over there. Once you have your alpha helices and your beta pleated sheets and your random coiled regions, you have more folding to give a really complex 3D shape. And if your protein is just made up of one polypeptide, then that's your final protein. So this is the final level for a single polypeptide. And that one polypeptide can be a protein. It can go on to do whatever function it's supposed to do. If you have more than one polypeptide that are going to interact with each other, that's when you get to the fourth level. And that's the quaternary structure. So it's made up of two or more of these polypeptides. 
and those polypeptides are called protein subunits. So those subunits come together to form these multimeric proteins. So this slide is showing kind of the four different levels for the structure, so you can kind of see it here. So on the left you have your primary structure, which is just that sequence of amino acids from start to finish. Secondary structure, you can see the alpha helices at the top, so those coil or spring shapes. And here you can also see the beta pleated sheets in the blue. So it kind of looks like an accordion. After that, so the secondary structure, you have tertiary structure, so you have more folding, you get that final 3D shape. And then if you have more than one of these polypeptides, they will interact with each other and you'll have the quaternary structure. So our quaternary structure, you actually have three of these polypeptides joined together to make this bigger protein. There are five factors that promote this protein folding and factors that help keep the protein stable. And these include hydrogen bonds. So we talked about hydrogen bonds already, so you should know what those are. So these hydrogen bonds, they help to stabilize the protein. They help to hold it together. You also have ionic bonds and other polar interactions going on within the protein to help stabilize it, to help with the folding. There's hydrophobic effects. So remember, some of those amino acids are hydrophobic. So the hydrophobic amino acids are going to try to get closer together and they're going to go into the middle of the protein, especially if the protein's in a water environment. So those amino acids are just trying to get away from the water. They're going to fold in to the middle of the 3D structure. There's van der Waal forces, which I won't talk about that much, but if you're in chemistry, um, you'll learn about the van der Waal forces. And then disulfide bridges, this is just when you have two sulfide um, functional groups that bond with each other and they form what's called a bridge. Proteins can interact with each other. So a lot of cellular processes that we'll get into involve steps where we have two or more proteins that interact with each other. So this slide shows a purple protein and then like a pinkish protein, so protein number two. Those two proteins can interact with each other and they can help speed up metabolism, they can help with reactions or whatever the cell needs to do. Alright, so that was all about proteins. So remember main things, proteins, the amino acid is the monomer. Those amino acids join together to form a peptide bond. And then um, familiarize yourself with those four levels of protein structure or folding. So how these proteins fold up to form these 3D molecules that have lots and lots of different functions.